Greetings and welcome back. Sorry, it's been a while since I posted a proper video. The summer has just been madness with house guests and work and even a little bit of travel, which has all been great, but it's kept me away from this project. Anyway, it's summer, it's movie season, and that means Oppenheimer is out, which is exciting because as I'm sure many of you already know, that film does something that has never been done before in the history of cinema. The black and white sections of the film were shot using the venerable Kodak X film stock, which means that Kodak must have done a special cut of X in the IMAX format just for this project. And that's really cool because Double X has such a storied history. It's really neat to see it breaking new ground so many decades after its initial introduction. And hopefully this will mean that other filmmakers will be able to use it as well. But what I think is even better than that is the fact that this movement into medium format size imaging already happened a few years ago for still photographers, thanks to companies like CineStill and others who've been spooling it onto 120 loads. This means that still photographers can shoot it in formats that are the same size or even larger than IMAX. So Oppenheimer, the fact that photographers can shoot double X in medium format, this is really fun stuff. And it's gotten me excited to shoot double X again myself. The thing is, Double X really isn't the kind of film that you can just throw in the camera and get stills that look as good as Raging Bull or The Lighthouse. Double X, like many film stocks really, has some specific characteristics that we need to understand in order to be able to craft the image, the look that we want. So today I'm doing something a little different for me and that is, this is gonna be a technical video. Um, don't worry, I won't do this very often. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present the best way I know to test a film stock to understand its exposure latitude and examine how details look at different exposures. Now, this method is not original to me by any means, but it's also not a method that I've really seen demonstrated on YouTube, and I'm not sure why. It's accurate. It gives us a detailed understanding of how film stock works. So I figure, what the heck, I'll put it out there and see what people think. Also, please note that you are not going to hear me use terms such as correct or proper exposure or over or under exposure as they are technically and conceptually inaccurate and contain value judgments that really should be avoided. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, under continuous lighting, we start by setting up a test scene with a fairly broad tonal range and different areas of local tonal contrast. Um, I used a spot meter to take my readings and recorded the results for reference later. I used a spot meter because I'm interested in the tonal values reflected by the each different object in the frame. If I were to use an incident meter, I wouldn't be able to read the reflected light or get this level of detail. Also note that I'm not basing my exposures on averages. Averaging exposures in a film test is always gonna create misleading results and it can't provide the level of detail that you're looking for. So what I have done instead is I've just done a series of nine exposures each one stop brighter than the previous. So here's the first image taken at F8 with a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second. This means that F8 represents what we can call N or normal exposures for the areas of the image that were reflecting F8 at one one thousandth of a second. In this case, it's the sunlit gray card. Thus, N minus one refers to an area that is reflecting one stop less light than the normally exposed area and so on. So the sunlit gray card is the anchor point of this test and every reading is made in comparison to it. Now, the brightest area in this image is the shell in the sun, which reads two stops above N and it has very little contrast. It might be difficult to see, but some detail is present. It's not blown out. But what I find more interesting in this image are the dark areas. 
The piece of white coral in the shade is at N minus two and shows good contrast and a lot of detail. The spotted shell next to it reads N minus three, but it has high local contrast, so you can see uh, good detail there as well. But now there's a small potato next to that shell, which is three and a half stops below N, and it has low local contrast. So you should be able to see that there's some detail there. It hasn't reached black yet, but in another half stop, less exposure, it would be difficult to read anything. So for the next image, I opened up the aperture to f5.6. The shell in the sun is now three stops above normal exposure, and it looks almost blown out, but there is some detail there. On the shadow side of the image, the potato is far more visible at two and a half stops below N, and the details of the shell and the rock are showing up really nicely at one to two stops below N. Also, take a look at the dark gray area of the card. This is reading N minus three, and there's just a little tiny bit of separation between it and black. So really, it seems like without much local contrast, the difference between N minus two and N minus three is really huge. So after looking at these two images, I feel like I have good information about um, the shadows with visible detail being present down to N minus three, but after that, detail falls off rapidly. So knowing that, my next question is how much more exposure can the brighter areas of the image handle? So in this exposure, the shell in the sun is now reading N plus four and it looks kind of blown out to the eye. Now, with I would say there is some recoverable detail, but the most I'm gonna get with a little bit of work is some texture, um, but areas this bright really resist heavy editing, especially because it's an area of low contrast. I should say that most of this image could still handle significant editing, uh, and there would just be a little bit of loss of contrast and, and highlight detail. So at this point, I don't think I need to go through all nine exposures because I've got the information that I was seeking. At N minus four, an area of low contrast, the image is really dark with almost no separation between dark gray and black. On the other end of the scale at N plus four, also in an area of low local contrast, there's just the slightest bit of texture, but with any more exposure, it would be totally blown out. So this being the case then, I'm gonna say that from black to white is about eight, eight and a half stops for double X. Now, to my eye, I really like the way double X looks between N minus three and N plus two, which I know is only a five stop range. But in that range, I know that I'm getting really nice details of area in both high and low contrast. Um, and I'm also getting really nice tonal separation. Uh, in addition to that, let's say I have areas that I know I wanna push to black, then I know I wanna go to N minus four or greater. Again, on the other side of the scale, if there are areas that I want to go to white, then I'm gonna be exposing those at N plus four or higher. Um, beyond those benchmarks, I will definitely be controlling the tonal range by using graduated ND filters and pull processing. Uh, and then I'm also gonna be really intentional about how I use highlights and the overall contrast of my compositions. So, I hope you found this evaluation interesting, and I would definitely like to hear from folks who've tested double X themselves. Did you get similar results to what I got? Or if you think I'm way off, let me know. Um, I should say, I don't think that one test is definitive, but it certainly provides a direction to work in. Um, and really, it's the roles after the test that are most important, because those are the roles where we really see if our thinking is on the right track or not. So 
Anyway, I hope that people will go out and see Oppenheimer and enjoy the double X sections of that film. And also, if you haven't seen The Lighthouse, I would say that that is probably the most masterful use of double X of all time. So I would definitely check that film out. It's from 2019. There is also a neat IndieWire article about the film in which director of photography Jaron Blaschke goes into some interesting details about he shot double X for that film. And I will include a link below to that. So anyway, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.